Hey everybody, welcome. It's Brian from Witch Doctor. I uh, hope you're all doing well. Um, wanted to do a video on uh, Shooter of the Year. It's a trophy that um, we hand out at the end of the year uh, to the shooter who has the best um, uh, categorical like aggregate based on the type of rifle. So light varmint aggregate, heavy varmint aggregate, sporter, unlimited, things like that. So uh, shooters accrue points over the series of uh, six, seven months uh, in, in shooting these um, National Bench Rest Shooters Association, NBRSA, 100 and 200 yard um, group matches. And uh, typically the matches are five shot, but we do have some 10 shot group matches uh, the five shot ones are usually shot with a bad gun, um, like a, a rifle like this that sits in a, a front and rear rest. And so we have those matches uh, throughout the year, uh, starting in March, going through September. And the person who wins, you know, the majority of the aggregates and accrues the highest number of points wins. And uh, this year that was me. Last year it was uh, Jeff Crows, who is a phenomenal shooter, a um, good friend of mine. And uh, he did it very, very well last year. Um, this is the cool trophy that they give you. Um, really awesome trophy. Big bullet. Um, I don't know if you can see that. Lapua 220 Russian. Pretty cool looking trophy. So very happy to take that home. And uh, so we'll go over a few things here in this video that uh, were important um, in terms of things uh, that I did along the way to, to win this. All right, well, the first tip is to shoot matches. <laughs> and that may sound uh, simple, but, um, you know, life is life, and there's a lot of things to do uh, in life, so you're not able to, you know, make the matches. Um, or if you're a new shooter and, you know, you're wanting to possibly get into it, come to matches. I mean, it is absolutely the best thing to do uh, when you're, you know, starting to uh, want to get into competitive shooting. Uh, up here in uh, Tacoma, Washington, United States, we have a wonderful group of, of shooters who will um, help to support you and, you know, get you running in the matches and get you going very competitively. Um, I mentioned Jeff Kroos winning this uh, shooter of the Year trophy last year. Uh, he's a relatively new shooter. Uh, he contacted me a couple, two, three years ago. Said, hey, I want to start shooting those matches. You know, I've shot a lot of silhouette and some other stuff, but, uh, you know, interested. So <laughs> within record time, we got Jeff spun up and ready to go. And uh, he did ex extremely well, obviously took uh, Shoot of the Year in uh, 2022. So um, so get out there, um, and if you need support for that, just, you know, and you want to shoot some matches here locally, let me know. Um, you know, you can just reach out to me, private message or email, whatever it may be. Um, the NBRSA also has a mentorship program, and that's something that um, uh, new shooters can take advantage of. Um, it's really good to get just get out there and see what people are doing, what kind of equipment they have and uh, you know develop your own uh, strategy your own equipment things like that so um, typically on a any given year that I've shot these matches here in in Tacoma the NBRSA group matches I have not been able to actually shoot every single match uh, that has been a challenge over the years uh, uh, last year I was uh, moving and moved into a different house and uh, I think I missed, you know, one or two matches just just moving. So um, every year there seems to have been something going on. And, you know, um, you got to go to all the matches to get all the points because we're shooting against extremely good shooters. And if you're not taking advantage of every single possible match, um, there's a good chance that you're just not going to get it. This year was different. Um, this year we had a lot of uh, people come into town to visit us rather than us having to go out of town to visit people and it just lined up perfectly to where I was able to shoot um, almost all the matches. Um, the last match that I shot uh, was a three day, it should have been, it was a three day match but I was only able to shoot one day and I did that purposefully um, to make sure that I got the amount of points that I needed to um, definitely win Shooter of the Year. 
And then I left that evening to go to uh, my, my friend's 50th birthday party. So anyway, um, so definitely getting the matches, definitely shooting them. I had a good circumstance uh, this year and enabled me to, you know, shoot almost all the matches and accrue uh, the amount of points necessary to take shooter of the year. All right, so another key component to, you know, performing at the level where you can, you know, win at the end of the year is mentorship. And I definitely have to thank all the mentors who've, who've helped me in my process. Um, I, I can't really identify uh, just one or two because, like I mentioned before, all the shooters in this area that shoot these matches have helped me in some way. Uh, some mentors, you know, take the time to explain their loading practices, shooting practices. Uh, some like to just sort of make some suggestions along the way. Um, some people like to provide like in vivo or on the spot feedback. Um, and that's also very helpful. I remember shooting a PRS match a few years ago and um, one of the shooters that shot in front of me in the order of, of shooters um, was hitting the targets pretty darn good. A uh, great shooter in that sport. And uh, I, I missed a few and he watched. And afterwards he came up to me and he said, what, how many mills are you holding? Cause it was a very windy day. And so we had to do a lot of holdover shoot, shooting uh, to adjust for the wind. And I told, well, my Kestrel is saying, you know, 0.6 mils and that's what I'm, I'm holding. And he just looks at me and he says, double it. <laughs> and uh, just walked away. <laughs> I was like, okay. So the next the next uh, match in that series, uh, I did. I doubled it, and sure enough, I was hitting the target every time after that. So um, certainly that kind of in vivo uh, or Johnny on the spot sort of feedback is also very helpful. Um, I was shooting a match this year, and uh, I, I knew I had made a mistake where I should have slowed down and watch the flags a little bit better, um, but I didn't. I just couldn't, I ran all my five shots, and uh, the person next to me on the bench um, turns to me after that and just kind of gives me the look, you know. And I, and I looked at him back. I said, "I know, I know. I should have, I should have, you know, slowed down and 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 waited that uh, that wind switch condition, but I didn't." And and he's like, yeah, he's like, that that gotcha, you know? And it's like, yep, it, it sure did. So um, that, that kind of mentorship uh, is, is very important. Um, and so anyway, and then also we have a good group of people, not just locally, but all around uh, the United States, even other countries where we're constantly uh, checking in with each other, um, you know, directly communicating about pertinent things. Um, just got a message from O Sandro in uh, Italy just now about some stuff. So you know, we a lot of a lot of communication going on uh, within matches, outside of matches, and all with the sort of you know purpose of you know self improvement, improving on various things, components. Um, get a lot of messages about te uh, testing. Hey, can you test this or that? We're interested in this. So um, just all of that, I just consider a great mentorship and I really appreciate it. So thanks everybody out there. You know who you are. All right, and another major factor, I'd have to say this is the most important factor uh, that uh, I think led to a, a good year this year was what I call the data-driven mentality. Um, I really love that uh, there's a, a sign in the Lou, Murtica, Lou Murtica's tunnel that says one test is worth a thousand expert opinions. And I have found that to be absolutely 100% true. Uh, and I have a completely data-driven mentality. Um, what that means is I use the data that I get from my testing to inform my practices. So, for example, you know, I, I did, well, I've done a number of tests. If you've been on my YouTube at all, you can see all the tests that I've done. And I use all that data to then inform my practice. So, uh, for example, um, my weighing primers is one really good one. Um, you know, I weight sorted primers and uh, went out and I shot them, measured velocity, looked at groups, all these things. 
And it turns out that, you know, having, uh, you know, weight sorted primers when you're shooting um, beyond 100 yards is, is a big deal. I mean, if, if you're shooting uh, different primer weights at 200 yards, you're going to get some uh, vertical, you know, showing up on target. So, um, you know, making sure that, that I weight sort those primers. Um, some lots of primers are very consistent and you might not have to, but um, I certainly do. Um, it's something that, yeah, it takes a little bit of time, but I normally am uh, multitasking when I do it. So I get other stuff done anyway. Um, another one I did was primer seating depth. So I uh, did some testing on that and it showed very clear that, you know, seating um, in the particular uh, type of pocket dimension that, that I use um, with my um, Norma brass, seating the primer, you know, seven to nine thousandths into the pocket was like the sweet spot. Um, so I definitely did that all year. Set my primer tool to prime it at exactly eight thousandths depth. Um, this really good PMA tool uh, primers uh, is the one that I used. It's very adjustable. You just sort of turn this knob and you can set it to really good specifications. Um, same thing with the 21st century second generation primer. Um, I basically use them both. I use this one at the matches with my PPC brass and I use this one uh, when I load BR brass. But anyway, um, some other things like not leaving around in a hot chamber. That one, again, you leave it in there for more than 15 seconds and it's a hot chamber, that bullet's gonna go out of the group. So um, those are the kinds of things, you know, also looking at uh, atmospheric data. Uh, I've done tons of work looking at atmospherics and found that uh, barometric pressure is a major factor. And uh, it, it, out here where I live, if the barometric pressure goes below 29.7, um, rest assured, whatever load you developed uh, under a pressure system that was higher than that um, is not going to work anymore and you're going to have to retune it at that point. So um, so all year, that's what I did. I was like, you know, I'd go to my weather app on my phone and pull it up and look and see, you know, what's, what's the uh, weather going to be like? What's the barometric pressure going to be like? Um, they have apps now where you can, you know, literally pull that up. Well, it looks like it's pretty high right now. And you can walk, you can see throughout the day, you know, where that barometric pressure is going to be. So um, certainly monitored that. Luckily, um, all my shooting was done in pressure systems that were above 29.7. So I actually didn't really have to retune much at all. Um, only had to retune when the uh, uh, temperature got really high because I shoot uh, pretty stout loads in this thing. And when the temperature gets above 65 degrees, those stout loads can be have high pressure and you get heavy bolt lift, all that stuff. So that's the only time that I really actually had to go and sort of redo the load. Um, another test that I did, anyway, I can go through all the tests and it'll take a long time, but just, just to illustrate again, um, was the torque on the action screws here, this one and this one, um, found that 65, um, inch pounds was the sweet spot. So, um, went ahead and made sure all, <laughs> you know, my action uh, bolts were torqued to that. Um, so anyway, all that to say is definitely use the data uh, to go ahead and um, make sure everything is in order and everything is done to where the data says, hey, do this. So one important aspect to this mindset is to be careful not to get derailed um, because oftentimes either on online forums or at a match itself, you know, you're talking to somebody and, you know, all of a sudden uh, they're introducing different ideas, you know, oh, well, no, seat to this or that or, or go by feel or whatever. And it's like, well, okay, thanks for that feedback, but, you know, I'm going to go ahead and do what the data says, <laughs> you know, um, especially online forums. I mean, I see the keyboard warriors a lot, you know, the people that, uh, basically have no data to support any claim they make, but they, you know, thunderously make the claim as if, you know, it's a, a, a better practice or, or whatever. Um, and so we see that a lot too. So uh, you got to be careful, you know, on those forums 
you know, uh, and, and like I said, I just trust my own data and I go with my own data and that's, that's what wins. So that's what I do. Um, anyway, and so yeah, a lot of the tests that I do, I publish on YouTube and it's all open source, you know. Um, I like Speedy, Speedy Gonzalez <laughs> mentioned that, you know. Hey, that's really cool, Brian, you know, it's open source. Uh, people could go in there and, you know, take a look and, um, you know, and see if it works for them too. And that's great, you know. So um, all open source data. Um, and if, you know, I get people that really try to challenge it without any data of their own, you know, I just go with my data, you know. Okay, thanks for that, but uh, nope, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, use my own data on that. I'm pretty sure um, it, it's, it, it's, I follow the data, basically. All right, and then another major factor is what I call a performance improvement mindset. So I've already done a video on this, so I'm not gonna go into like super depth on it. Um, but it's basically a mindset where you're constantly examining your performance and asking yourself, am I, am I doing things good? Do I need to make improvements to what I'm doing? Um, we all make rookie mistakes from time to time. Um, and, you know, as long as you're self-reflective and you're able to kind of put your ego aside and say, what did I do there that messed this up? Or why did I shoot big on this last one? Um, that's the kind of mindset I'm talking about. Um, asking other shooters what they did, you know, is also a big thing. So being social at matches is, is, is a big deal with the performance improvement mindset. Um, oftentimes, um, they will post the groups on a wall and a bunch of shooters will go up there and look at all the different groups. And that's a great opportunity to collect data. I call it the wall of data. Um, other people call it the wailing wall. <laughs> I call it the wall of data. You can see where wind conditions were. You can talk to other shooters. What what condition did you shoot in? Let's look at your group shape, things and size and things like that. Um, and so just getting that data, you know, on the spot and, you know, doing what you can to see if there's a way that you can improve. Okay. Um, anyway, so that's, and then in general, just over the course of shooting matches after every match I debrief you know I ask myself what did I do during this match um, that I can improve upon and make sure that I try to make those improvements you know for subsequent matches all right another important thing are components um, and I always take a look at my components and try them out you know make sure they're functioning well make sure they're the best you know component if another shooter has different components, try theirs out, see, you know, is this thing better than what I have? Um, that's always, always a good thing to do. Sometimes, I mean, rear rests are always a big topic, <laughs> you know, what kind of rear bag do you have? You know, is it the big ear? Is it the low ear? You know, how does it support the, the stock? All this kind of stuff, you know, so you, you know, you get to these matches and you start talking about this stuff and, uh, and it's fine to make some switches in your components if you feel that it's a better fit for you. Um, some, I'm not a bag squeezer. I'm not the type that puts my uh, shoulder on the rifle and squeezes the rear bag for my uh, vertical or even, you know, horizontal, whatever it may be. But uh, so I have a high ear bag and I set the rifle firmly in there and I crank my front rest, you know, very tight on the front. Um, you know, so I have, you know, I, I feel that those components are working really well for me right now. Probably not, not likely to change those, but certainly, uh, something to, to look at, you know, what, what are my components doing? Is it possible that there's better ones out there? Uh, try them out, uh, again, being social, you know, um, asking other people, can I try that out? Can I look through your scope? Whatever it may be. Someone has a different reticle. Maybe your eyes do better with a certain reticle than, you know, than, than your current radical. So um, those are the kind of things. And then the other big thing this year was I used the PRP bullets, uh, jo the Joker bullets. Um, these shot extremely well um, this entire year. Uh, these are made in Sunrise, Arizona by Paul Porosky. Um He's a bench rest shooter and he's got this uh, wonderful setup in his garage. He buys high quality jackets. He gets really good high quality mentorship. 
And um, when I first started shooting his bullets, I gave him feedback. These are great bullets. I'm definitely, they're shooting small ragged holes. So um, this year I decided, you know, I'm going to try the Jokers. And they tuned really easily. They kept shooting small all season. Um, again, through uh, March, through September, through different temperature swings, through different humidities. Um, just seemed to have shot really well. I used the short jacket, the 790. Um, he sells, you know, longer jacket bullets, 825s. Um, but these ones seem to have done the trick this year. Uh, last year I shot really good with the, the Diablo bullets, the PRP Diablos, but this year the PRP Jokers just seemed to rule the roost. Um, in fact, I, I got a really small group shooting these in my bag gun. Now, a lot of my zeros, what we call zeros, a group that measures um, uh, point zero something. Um, I do. I get a lot of these with my rail gun, <laughs> pretty, uh, you know, pretty much consistently every year. Get get a zero or two or three with a rail gun. But this year with a bag gun shooting those jokers, I got a a nice zero. Um, so they they not only shoot well consistently, but they definitely shoot really really small so I'd say that that was a huge factor was um, you know shooting really good high quality hand swage bench rest bullets um, that's that's a big deal um, and with those 790 jokers um, I had them they seem to shoot really really good for me uh, two thousandths off touch so that and I I was two thousandths off touch all season um, somebody asked me you know well don't you advance the bullet towards the lands after you wear out a barrel and stuff? And I was like, well, it's been just shooting 2,000 soft touch really well the whole time. And I think I, you know, shot from, you know, 100 rounds to I think about 800 rounds on the barrel and uh, didn't actually have to change the seating at all. Um, I think part of that is cleaning, you know. I, I don't know if, you know, you've been to many bench rest matches, but... Um, you often see in short range matches people cleaning their their barrels a lot um, i clean mine uh, either after every you know uh, five shot group or you know um, i'll shoot two or three five shot groups and then i'll clean it so i think keeping the barrel clean may have something to do with uh, retaining good barrel life um, i remember steve kostinich who well, actually who got shooter of the year in 2021 here uh, he's a, a imminent gunsmith here um, in the region here and um, you know I handed him a barrel one time I said can I you know get this barrel set back you know sort of rechambered I guess if you will and uh, Steve <laughs> calls me the next day he says man I'm looking down the bore scope to how many rounds did you shoot through this thing because I can't tell that it really needs to be set back uh, I told well I've shot like 800 rounds down it and He's like, it doesn't look like it. Um, so anyway, I think the cleaning practices may have something to do with that. I'm not 100% sure. It could just be high quality steel. You know, um, we use like Bartland and Krieger, you know, barrels, Hart, Schillen, those kind of barrels. So could just be, you know, really, really good barrels. But anyway, and then, yeah, you know, I use the Bat Nouveau action, um, really smooth action. Uh, it, it's a drop port, so doesn't have like an ejector on it you just pull it back and the piece of brass just falls down through the drop port right there and then I just put a little little thing below it for the brass to drop into so the brass doesn't get dinged up and whatnot but great action um, and then of course um, really good scope March scopes are phenomenal um, this one is a fixed 48 um, by 52 objective, um, a high master, uh, and it has what's called the raised reticle, the um, LR, LR means Lou for Lou Murtica reticle, um, where the reticle is raised up high, so the crosshairs is kind of on the upper uh, quarter of the scope. What that enables me to do is I can uh, see some flags inside the scope. So the flags that are way down range, you know, uh, 150, 175 yards. Um, when I'm shooting at 200, I can easily see the flags through the scope. Our range is uh, here locally goes up a hill. So 
at 100 yards, I don't see too many flags with the raised reticle. I think I can see like the last one, but um, at that point, I'm just visually looking at the flags um, outside the scope anyway. But uh, for 200, definitely comes in handy. Um, I like a, a crosshair with a dot, the particular, uh, that's just me. I, I, you know, again, everybody's eyes are different. Everybody has their own preference. Um, to find your preference, I, if you don't already have one, I recommend looking through some scopes and looking through them on the target you plan to shoot to see if, you know, that reticle goes really good with your eyes. This one, the crosshair with a dot, seems to be perfect for my eyes. Um, a typical target, I'm able to sort of center that dot in the, um, um, the middle circle, the really thick circle, and um, I'm able to... Uh, very easily very easily get that dot like in that thick circle and I can see it if the dot is above or below the dot like kind of fits perfectly in there um, and so I like that because that helps me you know um, uh, with my vertical setting up my vertical so anyway um, good high quality scope the visual on it is really really good uh, some people say, oh, it's a little bit darker than my Night Force, um, and I've had Night Forces. I, well, I do have Night Forces, and um, I think that's true. I think uh, some of the Night Forces that I've had are, are a little, slightly brighter, um, but for whatever reason, the picture on this, with this scope, uh, seems to be, um, you know, there seems to be a, 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 a still, like, more still picture, like, um, I don't know what it is, but the picture, I believe, is better in the marches. <laughs> All right, I wanted to pull out the, this is my front rest. This is called the Lindsay front rest. And I use this little block here, um, stick it in there in the front bag, and then that helps me get that level. Um, there's also a, a bubble level here on the actual rest itself. Um, really smooth joystick rest. Um, real, not only smooth, but it like stays in place, very rigid with these lighter guns, like this is a light varmint gun, weighing in at just below 10 and a half pounds. And then this really cool bullet loader here by PMA tool that just basically bolts right into the lensy rest there. Um, and then you can sort of move it however you need to move it to where you can grab the bullet and throw it right into the chamber really fast. Um, and I mentioned too, I keep this thing, you know, the front bag cranked down pretty hard on my, on the front of my uh, rifle. But yeah, these Lindsay front and rear rests are phenomenal. Uh, they work really, really well. I love them for, uh, for the lighter guns. I have a Seb Max for the heavier guns. Uh, the the Max just handles the major heavy weight of the heavy guns. Um, and then I also use a Flavio trigger. Um, it, that's a really nice smooth trigger um, I mean, I have it set just under an ounce so it's a super duper super duper light trigger um, anyway so what I find is um, in terms of bags the front bags here I don't fill 100% I want a little bit I probably estimate about 90% I want a little bit of give in the bag so that they form around the forend here. So you can see the angle of the forend. I want them to kind of come in and kind of conform to the angle of the, the forend there on the stock. So that, so that it's kind of clamped in place almost and stays tight. Uh, with my rear bag, my rear lensy bag, I fill the bottom portion 100%. I don't want I don't want this thing bouncing. Uh, if you don't fill it 100%, you know, there's a chance that this section here can kind of bounce up and down. And so this this bottom section of the bag is 100% full. It is extremely rigid. Um, it's like busting out the seams basically. <laughs> And uh, with the rear ears, I do like the high ears. I think that um, for my particular stock, they sit perfectly in there. And um, Lindsay and I think other manufacturers of bags sell, you know, different 
diameters inside here. So I made sure I got the diameter that really fits my buttstock well and I stick my butt all the way down uh, into the bag. And I've, these ears are filled about 90%. Again, I want them to kind of have a little bit of give to sort of conform uh, to the butt. And doing that, when I fire and then push it back forward to battery, I uh, get really good return to battery. I mean, sometimes it just goes right back to the previous aim point. Um, sometimes it's just slightly off and I just have to kind of move the joystick slightly to get it uh, right back to the aim point. So that, that setup, really good rigid setup seems to work really well there. Um, uh, kind of getting back to the original point of aim. Um, what I do though is uh, right when I start um, a, a match, like let's say it's a five shot match, um, I always bring cider bullets, just extra bullets, and uh, at least one fowler. Um, the fowler enables me to do a couple things. One, um, settle the rifle in the bags, take one shot, and then the rifle kind of gets settled in. And then I'll sort of crank this down a little bit more in the front. Um, and at that point, I'm ready. I can shoot on record if I want to. But usually I shoot a couple ciders to see if, you know, what the wind conditions are doing. Um, I also check the barrel too. Sometimes, um, sometimes I have barrels that need like one or two fowler shots. Um, or I have some barrels that need a cold bore shot because the cold bore shot goes high left or something every time. Um, so definitely no, I have to take notes on every barrel, but I usually always shoot at least one fowler shot so I can settle them in the bags and, you know, get my cold bore shot done and get a fowler in there. All right, one other thing in terms of components. This year I shot with this Eddie Harris tuner. Um, I've done some tuner testing that shows that um, this tuner here, also a Dan Bramley DSB tuner, uh, do really good when barometric pressure changes dramatically and your tune goes off. Um, I have uh, the testing that I did, I know exactly what setting uh, does better in low pressure, what setting does better in high pressure. And I have them numbered here on the tuner. I don't know if that's hard to see, but I wrote down in a marker the number. So if I know, okay, I'm in high pressure conditions, I turn the tuner to this particular setting where I know it shoots best in high pressure. Um, if I'm in low pressure, I turn it to a low pressure setting. Um, actually, this year with these short range matches, I haven't had to turn the tuner because um, they were all shot in high uh, pressure conditions. That's not always the case. Um, sometimes we'll get matches where there's significant shifts in barometric pressure. So it's nice having the tuner. Um, and sometimes barometric pressure can change during the day. <laughs> I've seen that too where, you know, all of a sudden the morning uh, it's in tune, shooting great, afternoon it's not. Again, I'll pull up my app, look, and go, oh, shoot, looks like barometric pressure had a major, you know, drop here, and we're now shooting in uh, different pressure conditions. Um, uh, if that did happen this year, which it didn't, but if it did, I would have easily been able to go, okay, put it on this setting, and bam, you know, uh, it'll get right back in tune. So I think in terms of components, that was another, another piece of the equation that... Um, uh, help me be ready for shifts in, you know, atmospheric, sp specifically barometric pressure. Uh, didn't have to use it, but certainly know that uh, I will have to use it eventually. I mean, it's, it's shooting out here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, it's definitely something that is going to um, occur. Um, I have had to do that in previous years uh, at various different types of matches too, not just uh, short range bench rest, but uh, bench rest for score matches. I've had to turn the tuner because conditions changed. Um, but this year with this short range, didn't have to. Okay, a little bit on match strategy. Um, try to make like a mental note in my head about how am I going to approach this match? You know, um, what am I going to do? What do I have time to do? And basically, my basic rubric for the strategy is to do load development in atmospheric conditions that are going to be this you know the same kind of atmosphere uh, when I do load development um, that uh, I'll be shooting the match in so 
Um, again, I've done lots of testing on this and barometric pressure is the biggest predictor of precision. And I know that, you know, I need to tune in the same kind of conditions. Again, looking up the app and looking forward and saying, okay, you know, what's the conditions going to be like uh, over the weekend or the match or the three day, three days in the match, whatever, two or three day match. Um, and making sure that I do low development in those conditions. Um, also, load development, I do different at 100 and 200. Uh, this is something that I think uh, surprises some people. Um, but for whatever reason, and I don't know exactly why, <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to speculate or throw out conjecture on it. I just know the data is the data. Again, I follow the data. The data says that I can shoot at 100 yards, typically very stout loads. And so what that means is um, typically I use N133 and I can, you know, fit up to, you know, 30.5 grains in a Norma case. Um, I'd say normally I'm shooting 30.2 at 100 yards. Uh, and that seems to do really, really well. Get, I think that small dot there, that zero I got this year was a 30.2. Um, sometimes, you know, go down to 30 or 29.8. 29.8 is kind of the lowest that, that I went this year, but I was typically shooting in the 30s, uh, more often than not 30.2. At 200 yards, uh, very different. Um, when, <laughs> if I shoot my 100 yard load at 200, uh, and again, this is using the same bullet, same seating depth, everything. Um, the seating depth I keep the same regardless, and that seems to you know work. Um, but uh, in terms of shooting at 200, I usually have to go down in charge. And so at 100, my load may be 30.2, but at 200, it may be you know 29.7. Um, so it's just, it's for whatever reason, that, and again, I follow the data, <laughs> it shows that uh, I, use, I have to use a different powder charge uh, for 100 versus 200. Um, now, I did have to change the powder charge during the warmer matches, like when the temperature got up to 65 degrees or greater, um, because if I shot 30.2 in that warm of temperature, again, I get really heavy bolt lift you can tell it's like over pressured so um, i had to do load development all over again when i knew okay it's going to be much warmer um, typically first three four months of matches uh, weather's pretty mild you know 50 degrees or so uh, 45 50 but then summer months come and it's you know 60 65 70 could go up to 80 90 um, and uh, at that point definitely have to adjust the charge so I think at 100 this year um, in 65 degrees or or um, or, or warmer uh, I think I shot 29.8 at 100 and then 29.5 at 200 and that seemed to have worked uh, really really well okay and then um, other things in terms of match strategy watching the wind is a big deal uh, these little, you know, <laughs> what are it, 68 grain, 67 grain bullets, uh, they get affected by the wind quite a bit. And so you have to, uh, I call it like micro wind reading, you know, have a really good set of flags, which I have really good flags or gram flags. I highly recommend them. And watching those flags uh, as much as you can um, and seeing is the flag switching is it going from left to right is it going outward inward uh, if it's going out or inward is it switching is it staying to one particular side um, that's a huge deal wind reading is a is a huge deal um, and one of the biggest um, issues we get at our range which is i call a wind bowl design where wind can kind of come in drop low and then swirl hit each other you can have flags literally two feet away from your flags that are all going one direction but yours are going a different direction um, it is a very tricky scenario you can't sometimes you can't rely on uh, your neighbor's flags uh, for you know for your own conditions um, sometimes you can sometimes it's you can't but wind switches are a big one and you know 
my shooting style, my general strategy is to get the five or 10 shots off as quickly as possible. Um, that's called running. Um, I'm a runner. Um, I remember one year shooting next to Gary O'Cock and after I ran my 10 shot group, he turns to me and said, you're violating the range rule of, you know, one round per second. And we kind of chuckled about that, but um, that's my, that's just what I do. I'll put all 10 in my hand and just start, you know, send them all down as quickly as possible. Um, sometimes that's not a good idea. Um, sometimes you have to do what's called picking. And what that is, is the wind conditions change so much, you, you can't really shoot in the same condition that you had with your last record shot. And so that happens a lot. And in fact, I'd say I picked, you know, probably more often than I ran this year. Um, I'm still improving my picking skills. I, I, I will say, I, obviously, I just, I prefer running. Um, I get my smallest groups doing that, but sometimes I shouldn't do that, but I do anyway. <laughs> Again, like I mentioned in the previous uh, uh, segment about mentorship, about how, you know, somebody mentioned, hey, you should have picked that one. Why'd you run? You know, um, that's something I'm going to, I'm an, an ongoing improvement thing uh, for me is learning how to pick better. But I picked a lot this year and it obviously went pretty well. Um, but definitely what that is, is, you know, shooting on your side or seeing where, where is it impacting on the target in a particular condition, going up to your record, firing in that condition, and then the condition shifts. And, you know, you only have seven minutes to shoot, you know, all five shots on record. So uh, it's very possible and actually pretty likely in many, you know, matches that you're not going to get the same condition that you shot your previous record shot with. So um, picking is then, you know, looking and like looking at flags saying, okay, now it's all kind of moving left. Previously it was moving right. I'm going to go down to the cider, fire one in that left condition, see where it hits on the target, and then I'm going to go up to the record and, and hold over uh, where I need to hold over to get the bullet to go into the same hole. Um, and so that is... Um, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult skill to develop, and you have to have a rifle that is really well in tuned. That's a key, that's key to it. If your rifle is not tuned as great as it could be, uh, picking won't even work because the bullet's kind of going to go in different directions. You, if you've been to matches, you've probably heard people say like, well, I shot on the cider and it went here, and then I went to record and held over and it went straight and it didn't go where it should have went on the holdover, right? Yeah, I hear that all the time. And uh, sure, it could have just been, you know, an errant shot or whatever, you know, um, but it also could just be a sign that your, your rifle is not as in tune as it could be because when it's in really good tune, um, that, that holdover should work. And uh, if it's in really good tune, it should work most of the time. Um, so that's, you know, that's the key. So running and picking are two uh, strategies that I usually go into matches, um, you know, thinking about. And again, like I said, it's it's really what I do is determined by the, the wind. What is the wind doing? If the wind is requiring that I pick, then I got to pick. Uh, if I can shoot all five or ten in a consistent wind condition, then I'll do that. I'll run them, you know. Um, but oftentimes, like I said, just we don't get the opportunity to have really good consistent conditions uh, in, in the particular uh, range that I shoot these matches in. So um, also got to look at down drafts and up drafts in the wind. So I'll put a, what's called an up down flag right at the berm areas where I know the wind if it's going out it's kicking up if it's coming in it could it could bring your uh, it could have a down draft and I usually just don't shoot when I get big up and down drafts. Um, it just I've I've shot in those a lot, and I don't get any real consistency in them. I it's just there's something about them that's just impossible to read. So I I call my up and down flag my go no go flag, and if it's up or down, it's a no go. I just don't shoot. Um, if it's level, then it's a go, assuming everything else is is doing well and. Um, I can go to record and, you know, shoot a good one. Okay, and finally, um, a segment on gear. Um, when I go to matches, typically have a lot of gear that I take. 
Um, I use an electronic powder dispenser. It gets me much, uh, in terms of consistency, better consistency than uh, other ways of dispensing. Um, I will bring a backup manual thrower. Actually, this year, I, I think I brought it only to half the matches. I didn't bring it to all matches, but I try to bring it to every match if I can remember it. Uh, sometimes it's hard to remember to bring all these things. Um, but um, definitely, and what I also do is I bring backup powder vials. So I'll know, you know, based on, you know, tuning the day before or two days before the match, whatever it may be, generally what the charge range is going to be. So if 30.2 uh, is working good at 100 and uh, 29.7 is working good at 200, I'll load 20 vials with 30.2, I'll load 10 vials with 30.1, 10 vials with 30 you know 20 vials with 29.7 10 vials with 29.6 10 vials with 29.5 and just bring that to the match in case something goes wrong and actually this year something did go wrong <laughs> i was uh, shooting i think it was the third match of the morning and my powder my electronic powder dispenser just stopped working um, i tried to pull up the app see if that can start it i unplugged it i put it in different plugs i asked someone to borrow their plug to see if it was just the plug that didn't work it turns out nope um, it just stopped working on me so I had to pull out the vials um, and use those uh, until um, the afternoon where a friend of mine um, with Jeff Cross here uh, uh, lent me his backup electronic dispenser um, so making sure that your gear you know is in good working order you know is, is key all right, so here's the powder vials. They are one and three eighths, um, four milliliter glass vials. Don't get plastic. If you do, some of the powder will just kind of stick unless you spray it with a static guard, which I'm not gonna sit here and spray 144 plastic vials with static guard. So I get the glass vials. And this, uh, and I, then I write down, you know, the grainage. So here's 29.8 grains looks like that was what I was running in the summer um, for my hundred yard load and you can see how much fits in there so if you have like a, a larger caliber you know a, a 284 wind for example uh, and you're putting in 50 grains you're probably not going to fit it in vials this small um, so definitely go with bigger vials for those bigger cartridges but for N133 when we shoot here, these four milliliter glass vials work perfectly. So anyway, yeah, when my electronics dispenser failed, I just grabbed these, loaded these. I didn't want Jeff to have to rush or me to have to rush to set up his backup electronic dispenser. It's, nope, I'll just pull these out and charge and then we'll worry about it during lunch. And that's a good way to, you know, have stuff to back you up. Um, I had to have a backup trigger too. I always keep a backup trigger. Um, I've actually had shooters where their triggers have failed and I've lent, lent that to them. This year this trigger did gum up. Luckily it only gummed up when I was uh, confirming my load. So I was able to take it home, clean it. Even after cleaning it, it was a little gummy. So I actually swapped it out and put my back up in there. Um, I also bring things like, um, uh, let's see, what else do I bring? Uh, like an air, a compressed air bottle. Uh, like if you ever, you know, have a bullet stick in the chamber and you pull it, pull, you know, pull a piece of brass out and powder gets all over the place. What I do is, um, I will actually, I mean, I bring the compressed air in case me or someone else does it. But what I do to prevent that, uh, is I'll, you know, tell the match director, Hey, I've got a stuck bullet. Um, I need to pull, pull the case out and then alert them that I'm gonna be picking up my rifle. And then I um, hold it like this vertically, and then I will um, take the uh, piece of brass out that way so I don't get powder all over the place. But sometimes, you know, you forget, and you, you, know, you think you fired the shot, you didn't, you go to cycle it, and all of a sudden a stuck bullet. But, um, so I bring, you know, compressed air for that kind of situation. Um, just, just, you know, some of the things that I know are potential, you know, likely fail points, um, have some kind of backup for it. 
Uh, especially if you're traveling, you know, and you're you drove 200 miles for a match. Um, I remember I was shooting a lot of PRS matches in Western Washington, and you know, driving five hours down the road to these matches. I would bring a completely other rifle just as a backup rifle because it's like I'm driving, you know, five and a half hours. Um, I'm spending money on a hotel. I've loaded 250 rounds, you know, if something goes wrong with this rifle for whatever reason, I can't fix it, Johnny on the spot. Um, I don't want to waste all that, you know, time and effort and all that stuff. So um, definitely part of the match strategy is making sure that I'm, you know, bringing things that uh, will help me compensate in case, you know, something goes wrong with, with the gear. Um, also, it's nice to have that stuff in case someone else has issues. Like I said, I've lent triggers. I've also lent scopes. Um, and Actually, this year, a shooter uh, had a scope just go south on him, and I ran home. Luckily, I'm only five minutes away from the range. But I ran home, grabbed my you know scope out of my safe, ran it down there. He installed it, and it started shooting great. So... Um, having stuff ready on the back up there in case something goes wrong, you know, always a good idea. Anyway, all right, everyone. Well, hopefully this was helpful to you. Um, I'd say, again, just all these different components to preparing for matches, you know, having that performance improvement mindset, data-driven mentality, you know, not letting uh, detractors sort of get you off, you know, convince you that, you know, that <laughs> your data is not right or, you know, you're misinterpreting this. It's like, nope, I, I follow the data. You know, all those kind of things are very important. Uh, and uh, definitely keep your principles intact. Um, be ready for, you know, when stuff doesn't go right, which it often won't. Um, have your shooting skills ready to run or pick. You know, all those kind of things are, are critical going into matches. And, um, Anyway, yeah, so hopefully all that helps. Uh, please join my Patreon page. Uh, that's a place where I, you know, post a lot. Um, my YouTube channel only gets, you know, big videos, but oftentimes I'm posting on numerous different things on my Patreon. So if you can join my Patreon page and become a patron, uh, it'd be much appreciated. Uh, all right, everyone, we'll shoot small. Good luck.